over here. Okay. So. Okay. The, the, the top. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right, so I'd like to thank all the organizers for this beautiful meeting. And okay, it's already quite late, this is the last talk, so I'll try to make it simple and hopefully brief. So um, this is going to be, uh, I'm going to give you s some history and what we were doing for the Businesk equation. And then I'll try to give you some proofs, hopefully easily followable. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Businesk system. It's a system uh, which is uh, coupled Navier-Stokes equation with the heat equation. And as usual, there is a usual notation about the gradients uh, and Laplacians. What's important is U, as usual, for the fluid flows is velocity. Uh, pi is the pressure, and T is the temperature. So uh, this is a thermal motion of a fluid, so imagine that you have a, well, I'll explain it in the next slide. I won't make it brief. So, so first of all, we have a usual Navier-Stokes equation. I'm sorry, I need to work with. I'll explain that. I'll explain that right now. Okay. So first of all, it consists of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, so that's a usual equation for the evolution of the, of the velocity. Then it has a, this additional term, which is called buoyancy term. And it's modeling that uh, pretty much the warm fluid is rising and the, hot, uh, and the cold fluid is dropping. So that's, that's, that's the responsibility of that term. Then there is a heat equation for the heat transfer. Okay, So there's a usual heat equation, T sub T is equal to Laplace of T. Plus, we are assuming that the heat is transported by the particles that are uh, distributed or going along the trajectories of velocity field u. And now, if you, find the mo if you, if you write down this model in, in physics notation, then it, of course, has millions of parameters. But after some rescaling and renormalizations, then you can actually you can, you can reduce those parameters into two. One is called Prandtl number which is quotient of the viscosity and thermal diffusivity. And the other is called heat Rayleigh number, which depends on many, many parameters, viscosity, thermal diffusivity, also on the size of the domain, gravity, and so on and so forth. So uh, the Rayleigh number is kind of complicated. Prandtl number depends only on the properties of the fluid. Okay, so it depends on the viscosity and thermal diffusivity. And know that the Prandtl number might be large, or maybe very, very large. For example, if thermal diffusivity is much smaller than the, um, than the viscosity, or it can be very, very small if it's the other way around. So there is no like, like canonical good range for which, for, for which the Prandtl number is either small or large. Okay, okay and then there is external forcing, and this is a stochastic conference, so of course the, uh, the forcing is going to be eventually stochastic. Okay. All right, so what about the boundary conditions? So the canonical model for the Businesk system that, that's studied for, I don't know, 150 years now is the uh, fluid confined between two plates. Uh, we are keeping the hot surface on the bottom and the cold on the top. So we can imagine it's like a heating coffee in the morning that you are heating water from below and cooling it from above that's, that's cooled by the air. Right. And, yeah. I, I, I'll get to that one, but I, I believe that F2 is more uh, physically motivated, yes. So, uh, 
uh, the reason for, well, I, I'll, 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 I hope I, I didn't erase that slide. Okay, so what we are going to assume that the boundary conditions is we are going to assume that there is a no slip boundary condition on the top and on the bottom, and the temperature uh, is bigger on the bottom than on the top. Okay, so by easy transformation, we can, we can assume that the temperature on the, on the top is zero and temperature on the bottom is positive. Then we can go to non-physical boundary conditions. It's a mathematically easier model. That's, that's going to be the torus. And I'm going to somehow wrap up the, the top and bottom boundary. In the horizontal direction, I'm always assuming um, periodic boundary conditions. Okay. All right, so there's a very short slide about the motivation. So <laughs> there are many, many models. There are many, many situations when we are modeling they're modeled by the Boussinesq equations. For example, uh, the atmosphere, the, the Earth is uh, warmer than the, than the space, so there is a natural convection. Uh, there is a, uh, the, the same is in the, in the Earth mantle, where the core is much hotter than the, than the, than the lithosphere. So, and, and this pretty much flow, flow is responsible for the, for the motion of continents and so on and so forth. Okay? The same is in the sun. Um, and in other stars where the core is much warmer than, than, than the space. And so we need, to, we need to take thermal effects into account. Okay. All right, so, all right. So the motivation, oh, I, I did erase that slide. So if you think about this situation and you try to decide where to put your forcing, then there is a natural stochastic forcing coming, for example, in the sun or in the earth mantle. Uh, it's the radioactive decay. This is inherently stochastic. Okay? We, we, we know that. And it's inducing some, it's adding some temperature to the fluid. So uh, you can be modeled as a, as a say, point, uh, point kicking in the, uh, in the temperature equation, or you can, you can have other, other, other reasons for the stochastic forcing in the, in the temperature equation. All right, so just very briefly, uh, if we are trying to, uh, this is an older result of, of ours, so if we on the torus, then we can get an uh, analogous result as uh, Aaron Mattingly did for the Navier-Stokes equation. Sorry? Who is D? Uh, D, oh no, I erased that slide. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This. You are completely right. So we are, we are summing, so, so our stochastic forcing is going to be um, n is equal to 1 to d. Actually, that's the number of modes that we are forcing, something like a e n x times uh, w n t. Okay. So this is our stochastic forcing, and this is the number of modes that, that, that we are forcing. Okay, that's, that's, that's coming into... D, D is the parameter of the stochastic forcing. All right, so uh, the usual method, well, the usual culture in the field is that uh, the smaller the D is, the harder the problem is to prove actually the uniqueness of invariant measure. And we were able to establish uh, the uniqueness of invariant measure when only four modes are, uh, only four modes are forced. And for example, the modes X1 and X2 and this is actually less than is needed for the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so for the Navier-Stokes equation, if you force it only with this forcing, it's not known if the, if the invariant measure is unique or not. Okay, so um, the point is that although we need less forcing, we have somehow more nonlinearity. So it's not only this Navier-Stokes term, we also have uh, this nonlinear term in the in the temperature equation that's, that's helping us a little. Okay, so there is a long history of this problem with various, various uh, versions of D. I don't wanna go into details. I'm probably going to skip uh, at least half of the people that, that work in the field. So, um, so that's about the torus. Okay, so what about if we take physical boundary conditions, meaning that I really have, uh, whether I'm fixing, uh, no slip boundary conditions on top and on the bottom. All right, so the problem is harder, and there's like a subtle, subtle problem 
and we cannot do, we cannot do the hypoelliptic case, and we cannot do even the hypoelliptic case in the, for, for the Navier-Stokes equation only. Okay, so this is not really technical difficulty of the Bussinets equation, but it's, it's inherent there. All right, nevertheless, we can prove that there exists, so the question is, can we get the existence and uniqueness of invariant measures, okay? And the other motivation is going to be uh, to investigate what happens when the parental number goes to infinity, okay? Let me, let me, let me talk about that. All right, so uh, what we are going to work on is the dimension when the dimension is two or three, so both physical dimensions, okay? So, uh, this always, already looks very, should look very, very suspicious. How can we work for the 3D Boussinous system when we, there's a Navier-Stokes equation, we don't even know it's well posed, okay? So the problem what we are uh, solving is a little bit easier. It's a little bit of cheating. So uh, in 3D, what we can prove that there exists a stationary state. That's probably not a, not a big deal. The existence is known for, for these. Uh, for these problems by the krilov bogolyubov procedure. And these states are unique in 2D, okay? That's probably culture that, that like many people would be able here to solve it maybe in 10 minutes. Um, then what we can do is when Prandtl number is infinite, so that really means that this, num this term is not there, then we also have unique invariant measure in two or three dimensions. Okay, so we can, we can prove that, which maybe it's again not too surprising because, okay, the, the bad term is gone, so, so we, we, can, we can proceed. And the result that, that may be the most interesting of those is uh, in 2D or 3D, uh, if we pass the limit, Prandtl, uh, so, so we have a unique invariant measure that we call mu infinity when Prandtl number is infinite, and then, uh, uh, if we try to calculate the distance between Prandtl number for finite, so, sorry, the, the invariant measure for finite Prandtl number and the infinite, uh, sorry, the distance of the measure for the finite Prandtl number at, and the distance to the infinite Prandtl number, we can actually prove that they converge to each other. So technically, we don't know that the measure is unique because it's a 3D problem and the problem is hard. Nevertheless, if the Prandtl number is getting larger and larger, then all the, all the invariant measures, no matter, uh, no matter if it's unique or not, are going to converge to this unique invariant measure at the, at the end. So this, okay, so the problem is, what, one of the problems is if you think about uh, the, the system when Prandtl number is infinite, this is not evolution problem anymore. Okay, we are losing time derivative. We are killing the uh, Navier-Stokes term, but we are also losing the, the, the derivative. And at that moment, your phase space is just one dimensional. It's only temperature equation. Whereas where these invariant measures for the, for the full system live is four dimensional. It's one, one, one component in temperature and three, three components in the velocity. So it's not even clear what you mean by convergence. Yeah, it's four-dimensional objects converging to the one-dimensional one. Nevertheless, it's possible to, to prove that, that such a statement holds. All right, so the state of art right now, as, as I know for the Bussines case, for the Torvus, we have a complete answer for the hyperelliptic case for the, for the system which has, which has uh, boundaries. We need sufficiently many modes to prove uniqueness in 2D, and in 3D we have these results uh, about the convergences. All right. So let me. All right. So now I, I would like to talk about. Well, this is going to be the main part of my talk. So now the question is, uh, what happens if we don't have that many modes, even in the hyperelliptic case? What if we are forcing just very, very, very few modes? So uh, for the title of this conference, or the topic of this conference, of course, there's no way that we have any controllability that we can get anywhere in the space, okay? So the question is, is this problem anyhow interesting and what do we wanna do about that, okay? So, so first of all, what happens if we don't have, if, if, if we don't have enough Lie brackets, if, we, if, if the noise is not spanning the whole space, okay? 
So, for example, the motivation is if the, if the noise is acting through the boundary, then we can substitute it off, and suddenly we have, we have very degenerate noise that's, that's coming into the equation. Also, uh, okay, so the answer that I'm going to talk about is what if our noise acts only in the vertical direction? Okay, so in that case, we have a huge advantage because I'll show you on the next slide, we can write down what's the invariant measure that's very explicit. And, and another, uh, another ingredient of this one is, okay, if we have unique invariant measure, we saw this one in all those talks, we have this exponential mixing or attractivity, uh, attractivity to the unique invariant measure. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's clear. But what we don't know, and that was question of Sergey, one of the first questions of the conference, is do we know anything about the distribution of invariant measures? Do we know where they live? Are they living in the high modes, low modes? What's, what's the distribution of those? So the point is, that uh, uniqueness is implying somehow stability, okay? So everything is attracted to this unique state. Well, if we are in, the, in this very degenerate case, then we have very explicit invariant measure. We know what it is exactly, okay? We can write it down. It's just a bunch of OU processes. That's, we know exactly how, 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 that, how, that, um, how that measure looks like. Now, if it's stable, then we know that it must be unique, and that's the limiting measure, okay? So that's, so that's the limit measure. Now, the question is, for which parameters this measure is stable, meaning for which parameters we actually know how the invariant measure, the unique invariant measure looks like? And, of course, there is an there is open question, if we are going out of these parameters, are we still close? To the, uh, to the invariant measure. So can we say something about the distribution of the invariant measure? All right. So what I'm going to talk about, now take the, this, again, the Bucinet system. Now the slides, slides are going to be pretty full, but I'm going to write down quite a bit on the board. So what we are going to do, we are going to assume that the, that the forcing is acting only in the z direction, okay? So, right, let, me, let, me, let me start using the board. So this is not going to be that important yet. So, uh, okay, so stochastic forcing all acts only in the z direction. So we don't expect the uniqueness of invariant measure, but still uniqueness is related to the, to the stability. So, so first of all, how does it look in the deterministic setting? So again, we have this uh, domain, just like between two plates, and in the deterministic setting, meaning that when sigma is equal to zero, no forcing, then uh, if a Rayleigh number is small, then we have a globally attractive equilibrium. And that globally attractive equilibrium is equal that u is equal to zero, nothing is moving, and temperature is just a linear profile. So when you're heating your coffee in a, in a, in a way, for a while, the, the fluid is not moving. All the, all the temperature is moving only by, uh, only by conduction. There is no convection. There is no motion of the fluid. Okay, so, so this is when Rayleigh, so this is, this is, this is a solution. So this is a solution, and what's important is stable if this Rayleigh parameter is small. If the Rayleigh parameter is small, then, then this, uh, this, is a, this is a... Now, this is a classical result, um, classical result of Rayleigh that what he proved is that there is a loss of stability for a large Rayleigh number. Okay? I'm going to talk about this one a little bit later. So now, in the stochastic setting, so now imagine that the stochastic setting is not zero, we still have something called, so this is deterministic, and now stochastic. So the stochastic one is we still have this conductive state. That's a huge advantage when u is equal to zero. And uh, what's the equation for the temperature? Oh, sorry. It's, it's just the usual 
how you process minus this is the vertical direction of tau is, is pretty much stochastic forcing. Okay, so, so this is a nice, nice equation. Everybody can solve this one. It's a heat equation with the stochastic forcing. It decomposes into the, into the Fourier modes. So the solution is completely explicit. It's just a sum of all your processes. Okay, we can write down what the invariant measure is. We, we, can, we know everything. Okay. So now the question is, the uniqueness and stability of the full system, meaning when u is non-zero, well, it will depend on parameters. If this, if this uh, invariant state is stable, then we have uniqueness. Everything is, is, is going to that one. If uh, we don't have stability, then we, are probably, we probably don't have uniqueness of invariant measure. Okay. Uh, in this situation, it's harder, yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, 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 this, in this case of thermal, yes. All right, so what do people are doing? Okay, so we have, a, we have one state. So in order to ass, uh, assess stability, well, we just calculate the fluctuations. Okay, so what we are going to do is I'm going to, write the I'm going to decompose my solution temperature in the temperature as my state that I know what it is. That's my OU process plus some fluctuations. Well, if you, if you write down the equation for the fluctuations, I don't wanna, it's, 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 it's rather trivial, and you use, you use the energy estimates, you just multiply the first equation by u, the second equation by theta, then you get this equality. Okay, so now this, this is getting interesting. So you have one half of derivative of the L2 norm, so that's, Theta square is the fluctuations plus one over Prandtl Rayleigh. Those are some parameters. The u u two square is actually equal, and that's going to be minus gradient of theta square plus gradient of u square with parameter Rayleigh, and then there is a nonlinear term plus integral u d. There's a d component theta, the derivative with respect to xd of tau minus one, and there's an integral between zero and one. Uh, sorry, this is over the domain, over the domain d. All right, so the point is, so these are fluctuations and we'd like them to go to zero. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just divide this guy by the, by the right hand side, theta square plus one over Prandtl Rayleigh u2 square, and multiply it back. A good habit. Okay? So, sounds good. So now I'm going to denote this factor. I'm going to denote this factor uh, lambda, which depends on tau. Well, it's going to be a little bit slight, slightly different, so let's, let's call this one capital lambda. So this is a stochastic time-dependent quantity. Now, there is, a, there is a big step what was done in, deterministic, in the deterministic case. I'm not going to calculate this lambda tau. It's a mass, okay? What I'm going to do I'm rather going to de uh, denote lambda tau to be just infimum with respect to theta and u of this, of this quantity. Gradient theta square plus one over Rayleigh h1 norm of u square plus uh, integral over d u d theta let me just erase this one, it's not going to be important, so. Over d, u d, theta, and then, and then L2 norms. Okay, so now this system is not, uh, and for fixed, so given, 
So I'm going to denote this quantity. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, this is very important. There's a minus sign here. Okay. So, all right, so the problem is, so, so, so this is the infimum over all u and theta. So that really means that if I can prove somehow that lambda is positive, lambda is positive, then uh, for my tau, say for every tau, then this is of course exponential decreasing, exponential decreasing P, uh, uh, differential equation, and it must be converging to zero. Well, hoping that lambda goes to zero, uh, lambda is always positive for any tau is probably uh, a, little bit, a little bit too optimistic, but nevertheless. So, so just, this is just a remark. Uh, when we are in deterministic setting, meaning that tau is equal to uh, one minus z, then we also know that lambda negative this variational problem implies instability. This is a non-trivial proof. Okay. Uh, in our setup, we don't know what's the instability criterion. Okay, so I'm going to prove only some criterion for stability because you see, for the stability, it's great if I take still infimum and have positivity. However, for the instability, I shouldn't take the infimum and I'm back in the full problem and that, that one is a mess. All right, so what you can do, and I'm just going to tell, I'm not going down this rabbit hole because it's hard, I think it's hard. So what you can do is, okay, you can find, you can decide, okay, it's a minimization problem, so I'll just write the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay, so if I write the Euler-Lagrange equation for my variational problem, I'll get this coupled system, and there's a coupled system of four equations, so if you're smart and you apply it curl twice to the velocity equation just to get rid of non-divergence condition, then you get the system like an eigenvalue problem that, that looks like this. Okay, maybe there are some people that can do something with this problem, but it looks very, very bad to me. Okay, so this, this problem, I need to, the, the, the question is, can we estimate the distribution of lambda if I give you the distribution of tau? I, I literally don't know how to do this one. Okay. So I don't want to go down this, 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 this rabbit hole. All right, so here we come. So this is our minimization problem. So the good habit is uh, we should have existence of minimizers that we know that we are solving something. Okay, so in order to prove the existence of minimizers, uh, it's rather easy because we know that this nonlinear term for if tau is L infinity in X, it's actually sum of finitely many cosines or sines, so it's not a problem. Then we can estimate the nonlinear term by the L2 norms, and that gives us immediately that the functional is bounded from below. So it's a bounded from below functional. It's quadratic functional. It's like one line proof to prove that it's weakly lower semi-continuous. And you open the book on the page one on variational methods and then you see the result there exists a minimizer. Okay. That's, 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 that's about that difficult. All right. So now the question is, what are we after? What's the criterion? So notice again that our system, since I took infimum, the, the OD that we'd like to solve has this lambda on the right-hand side. So now imagine that I fixed T tau, meaning that I fixed one trajectory in my, in my noise, and I get tau. And uh, so I know that if this integral between zero and an infinity lambda is positive, then, um, then the solution is actually exponentially decreasing strictly positive. All right, so that's good, but the problem is that tau depends on the noise and so on and so forth, so it's rather complicated. However, this is where ergodicity kicks in. So what I can do is, I'm not going to, I'm going to take, v, uh, I'm going to assume weaker criterion. So imagine that I take integral and divide it by t, and I send t to infinity. 
if I know that this is positive, then I'm still good to go with exponential decay. Okay. That, that really means that this is, um, yeah, this lambda increases like some constant times t at least, and, and this, is, this, is, this is going to give me the exponential decay. All right, but now you notice that here it's only tau, which is the OU process. We know everything about the OU process. Lambda is a continuous, depends continuously even as a Lipschitz function on tau. So I can invoke some results from ergodicity and realize that actually I don't need to take these integrals between zero and t. I don't have to take time averages. I can take just expectation. All right, so here is, here is a general thing. I, I think, okay, I'm always afraid of, of this slide a little bit in front of any audience because somebody may tell me that, that this result is known for 150 years. Well, maybe not, but for 50 years. So I'm, I'm literally asking if you know, know any, any results in this direction. You have variational problem where some coefficients depend on some stochastic parameter. Say this is Gaussian. Imagine that tau is Gaussian. So I have a Gaussian distribution and I have a, qu a quadratic functional or any other functional. The question is, I'm asking, what's the expectation of the minimum? Are there any results about stochastic variational problems that anybody's aware of? I, I would be really happy if you, if you, if you, if you can tell me. Okay, so and there, there is maybe possibility for like doing like some, maybe, maybe it's hard, but there is a possibility to start developing the theory of, of random variational problems with, with certain, uh, with, with trying to find the, the distributions of the minimizers. Here I'm looking only for the expectation. And the point is that if I have that the expectation is positive, then I have stability. If the expectation is negative, I don't know, but there is a good indication that there is an instability. Okay. All right, so what can we do about this one? So this, this is actually a very, very good problem because everything is quadratic there. So, uh, so first of all, the hope is that there exists something like a critical Rayleigh number, as in the deterministic case, saying if, I'm, if my Rayleigh number is small, then the state is going to be stable. If the Rayleigh number is large, then the system is going to be unstable. Okay? That's kind of the hope. All right, so this is actually something that we can prove. Well, not with the instability, but... So... Um, all right. Oops. So let me tell you how to, how to do that one. So I'll take just the minimizer. So I'll take uh, lambda with the fixed tau is actually equal to uh, gradient of u square plus the other terms divided by theta bar square plus the other term. So I'm just going to plug in the minimizer and since this is infimum with respect to all functions, what I can plug in, oh, let me, let me just write down this, this term. The important term that I have here is integral of u d bar theta and some term here. And this, this is the term that, that I'm interested in. So I choose a competitor. And as a competitor, I'm going to choose u bar minus theta bar. So you plug this one in, the value of the functional must be bigger, okay? U bar theta bar is the infimum, so this must be bigger. All right, um, all right. I, I, I'm sorry, I messed up a little bit. Just, just give me, bear with me for a, for a second. Uh, if, you, if you have this, uh, I need to do very, very quick uh, substitution. What I do, I rescale U by square root of Rayleigh. So that really means that this Rayleigh from here will disappear. Rayleigh from here will disappear and it will show up here as a square root of Rayleigh. Okay. So, square root of Rayleigh. There is no other, no other Rayleigh there. Okay, so if we plug in the competitor, then you see everything is in the norm. So, these two terms are the same. Denominator 
is exactly the same. The only thing that will change is I'll get here minus Rayleigh integral u bar theta bar and so on. So from here we immediately have that the integral of u d bar theta bar and then here is the derivative with respect to tau minus 1 must be non-positive. And actually you can prove that it must be negative on some set when tau is large. Okay, when tau is large, then we can prove that this inequality must be actually strict. Okay? And now we see that if I'm increasing Rayleigh, the only thing that's changing here is this term. Well, I see that this term is negative. If I'm increasing Rayleigh, then this minimum must be decreasing. Okay? There's a little calculation, like two lines long, that, that's going to give you that. So it means that this is pointwise decreasing, and since this inequality is strict with positive probability, we know that uh, this expectation must be strictly decreasing with the Rayleigh, with the Rayleigh number. So it's not increasing, it must be strictly decreasing. All right, so th from that we know that, of course, there is only one zero of the strictly decreasing function. So it might be finite or it might be infinite, but we know that it cannot happen that we have stability, instability, stability, instability. We cannot have any switchings. Once we go from, uh, from uh, positive to negative expectation, then, then we are done. We cannot come back. All right. So, so that was easy. So, so, so now the question is, so, so this is a very curious and somehow mind-bugging uh, simulation. So we did numerical simulation on this problem. And we were uh, comparing the stochastic forcing to the deterministic forcing. Okay, so we took the stochastic forcing and then the deterministic one was when the, when the uh, forcing was assumed to be just one. And this is what we found. Okay, so deterministic forcing, uh, we have the, the strength of the forcing. There's the parameter in, in front of the force. And then we were looking at the critical Rayleigh number. And not surprisingly, maybe if the forcing was zero, then it was exactly the same as it was calculated for the, for the deterministic case. And then as the uh, forcing was increasing, then our critical Rayleigh number was decreasing all the way to zero. Okay, so if we are pump pumping more and more deterministic forcing, the, the system is somehow becoming more and more unstable. Fine, probably believable. All right, so what happened with the stochastic forcing is it's kind of, kind of strange because we start putting the stochastic forcing, then it was kind of equally stable as if there was no forcing at all, okay? So in particular, the stochastic forcing was somehow more stable than the deterministic one. It, it seemed like the stochastic forcing was stabilizing the whole situation a little bit. Then, on the, on the, when the force was, was of order one, there was a very sharp transition, and suddenly the stochastic forcing was destabilizing the whole situation. So the stochastic forcing was requiring smaller and smaller Rayleigh number compared to the, compared to the deterministic forcing. So it seems that for small forces, stochastic forcing is stabilizing. For the large one, it's destabilizing compared to deterministic ones. The question is, do we understand, can we say something about this one? Can we, can we somehow fill this numerical picture? All right, so I go back to my functional. And in order to get some, something about uh, so, so, no, so recall, I'd like to say something about the expectation of lambda as a function of tau, and tau is something like a, it's something like a normal distribution. It's a stationary, stationary uh, measure for the OU process. Okay. So I would like to say something about this one, and we all know this, this is something like lambda x times e to minus x square. Okay, so I'm, I need to integrate the function against the Gaussians. So in order to, to do some estimates on this one, I would like to know something about tau. 
uh, sorry, something about lambda. Okay. That's, 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 that's kind of my goal. So the problem is, okay, lambda is the minimis, like a minimum of some variational problem. It doesn't look that easy. All right, so, but surprisingly, there, there, there are some things that we can say and actually conclude some, 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 some results. So we can prove that the function is continuous, hopefully believable, and it has one-sided derivatives. And it's not only that. I'll show you, it's actually the crucial, one of the crucial calculations, which is rather simple, and, but still reasonably powerful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate what's the lambda tau plus delta times v. I'm going to choose my direction, and I'm trying to differentiate in the direction of v, my lambda. All right? So what I can do, I know that this is actually less or equal. Then if I take my functional, let's call q, this is the functional q, at, with the parameters tau plus delta v. But I'm going to plug in the wrong function there. I'm not going to plug in there the minimum for tau plus delta v, but I'm going to plug it in u and theta for tau. I'm going to plug in the minimum for the functional tau. Okay. And of course, this is a test function, admissible, so this is going to be just bigger. Hopefully not a big deal. But now, if I plug it in, so you see there's a quadratic, uh, there's a quadratic, everything is quadratic there. Uh, so what I'm going to get is q at tau, u tau. And the only thing that's, that's, that's sticking out is, is this term. When, when, when I, here I don't have tau, but I have tau plus delta v. So the additional term that they get there is delta integral u tau theta tau partial derivative of x d of v dx. But this term is immediately lambda tau. It's just a simple calculation. Just plug in the, the other function, multiply everything out, and that's it. But now this is good because you see this is almost, if I move this one to the other side and divide by delta, then I get something like lambda tau plus delta v minus lambda tau divided by delta is less or equal than this integral that's there. All right, so I can pass to the limit, and I get something about the limb soup. So actually, I can, I can, I can calculate that, uh, that the derivative from the right of lambda in the direction of v is actually equal to infimum, uh, uh, yes, infimum with respect to all minimizers, that all of this integral. OK, so I can calculate that. All right, so I have one-sided derivatives. I can also calculate that the derivative from the, from the left is the same quantity only with the supremum, same argument. Not, 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 not anything is different, okay? So I know the one-sided derivatives, and on the top of that, I prepared the calculation, but I don't have time for that. I can prove that the function is concave. The lambda function is concave. All right, so notice, again, I need some estimates on the function lambda. So I know that the function is concave, and I have one-sided derivatives. Well, what else do I need? I also need to fix the value of lambda at least at one point. 
Well, that's good because when they plug in tau is equal to zero, then this term will disappear. And the functional, So here I have a little lambda is also concave. Now I can plug in tau is equal to zero and get lambda at zero is something like an infimum of gradient u square plus gradient of theta square minus integral of u d theta divided by u square uh, there's a square root of Rayleigh, just to keep it here, theta square. All right, there's nothing stochastic about this one anymore. There's nothing, this is a quadratic functional. This, this, this is it. So you can do analysis, and this time you can write Euler-Lagrange equation. So if you write Euler-Lagrange equation, let me just go back to, to the Euler-Lagrange equations that were here. So now this term is gone. This tau is gone. And you can write everything in the Fourier space. And if you write down everything in the Fourier space, that's actually very similar to, to what Rayleigh did. Then write everything down in the Fourier space. Then you can... I probably don't want to bother you with that. So just believe me, in Fourier space, so imagine, so these two times curl helped me in many ways. It uh, killed the divergence, but it also reduced the problem from four equations to only two equations. Is the equation for u, d, and theta only. There's nothing else sticking out. And tau is gone, so in Fourier space, this is going to give us a system of two algebraic equations. Okay. All right, now, we are get, now it's getting ridiculous, okay. The analysis is not that, different, that, that easy still because it depends on the Fourier coefficients and we need to somehow minimize lambda with all the Fourier coefficients. It's getting a little bit hairy. Nevertheless, it can be done. Okay? So what we, can, what we can do, we can estimate the values at zero. So this, this is deterministic calculation done 100 years ago. And we also have a global bound on the derivative. Look, we also know that the derivative, plus or minus derivative of lambda, this is this calculation, this is why I wanted to have a one-sided derivative, is actually less or equal than something like a supremum of tau. And then I'll put L2 norm on theta an L2 norm of u, oh, sorry, there's a derivative of, of tau, not that important, this is super smooth function. And now I just estimate this one by the derivative of tau, and then here I put theta square plus one over Prandtl Rayleigh u square, square root of Prandtl Rayleigh. Okay, and this one, I can assume is equal to one, because it's in the denominator on my, on my, um, on my variational problem, and I have a global bound on the derivatives. Okay, if you do the calculations carefully, then this bound, this constant c, is comparable to the derivative at zero. It's not much bigger. It's not of different order of Rayleigh or Prandtl numbers. All right. So now we are in good shape. Okay, so now, you see this is kind of easy calculations, more or less, maybe. And now what do we know? Yeah. 
here is my forcing H. And here is going to be my uh, lambda, how lambda behaves. So now I know the value at zero. That's good. I know the derivative at zero. Actually, we can calculate the derivative at zero. And I know that the function is concave. So the derivative at zero is going to give me a line. So this is the line with the derivative at zero. This is another line. This is when the, this is the line with the derivative of lambda at zero. This is a maximal derivative of lambda. And I know the function is concave, so it must be somewhere in between. So I know that lambda is concave, and it must lie somewhere in between. Now, I'd like to have an estimate. So, so I can estimate this point. Let's call this point h star. I have an estimate how to, where this h star is placed. Okay. I have maximal derivative, minimal derivative. I'm sorry. I know where it intersects 0, roughly. And now, how do I get the estimate for lambda? Well, lambda is estimated from below by the line connecting 0 and h star. The function is concave. And on this line, I take the maximal derivative. I know that the functions can be increasing more, so that's the lower bound. And the upper bound, do I have another color chalk? I do. The upper bound, I'll take the tangent at the h star. The function is concave, so the function is from below. And I know that the function is also decreasing. It's not difficult to prove, so I can just cut it off here. So this is going to be my upper bound. All right, so that's, and that's it. So with some suffering and calculations, again, Gaussians, so I need to integrate it against Gaussians, we can actually prove that when Rayleigh number is very, very small, then is more stable than the deterministic one. We can compare it to that one. And by, by, by the estimating lambda actually from below, by estimating lambda from above, we can prove that when Rayleigh is large, then the whole thing is more unstable than, than the deterministic forcing. All right, so we can get all these upper bounds and get stability and instability. The, uh, the, the result is, of course, suboptimal. We need to do some estimates. We, need, we have this only for like close to zero or close to infinity, but nevertheless, we can somehow justify the picture. All right, so. This is the last slide, like literally one minute. Uh, the point is that this is a very flexible framework. You see, I want to point out this is an example, but possibly there, is a, there must be many applications to other variational problems, like stochastic variational problems. Try to Google it, they didn't find almost anything. Okay, so we were able to, uh, to, use, this, uh, to, to use this framework to other situations. Uh, for example, when, when we have forcing on the boundary, stability of quiet flows, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there, there are other things where you can, you, can, you, can, you can proceed in this way and get some, get some quantitative bounds on the, on the stability of invariant measures. All right, so this is actually giving us that not only that we have uniqueness of invariant measure, we actually know what it is. It's a OU process. The question is what's happening after the bifurcation, after you lose stability, that's another maybe interesting, maybe very hard direction. It's like a dynamical system on invariant measures, maybe. I don't know how to name it. Hard to say. Instability is open. We don't know how to do it. It means that you are not working with the variational problem or somehow relate the variational problem to the full problem. That's not clear how to do. And uh, also, we'd like to prove continuity on invariant measures, meaning that saying, okay, maybe we don't have uniqueness of invariant measure anymore. 
we don't know any you know, example of that. But maybe still when we are close to the line, our, our invariant measure should be close to the, to the OU process that we constructed, the one that, that's, that's there. That's another, so meaning if I, if I start adding forcing into, into other not only vertical modes, we know that the, the measure is unique. If the forcing is small, is it still close to the invariant measure that we constructed? That's not clear. Okay. All right, so there are a couple of papers, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>